So yeah, I'm in Miss Wilson Bay on on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, but we'll leave uh, Tuesday. We'll leave. Uh, Tuesday is a travel day, so I'll make the class, and we'll leave. I'll let me and her leave back to the class. Uh huh. Next week. Yes. And then I said next Thursday class will be online. Everybody okay? We don't make don't make any difference if you're okay or not okay. <laughs> It's going to be on YouTube, huh? I'll put a link on, I'll actually put a link on the website so you don't even have to go on, on into my channel. Huh? No, I'll put it in the course content because it's actually going to be a lecture. Huh? I'll be, it'll be in course content. I will. I'll tell you where. I'll send you. An email. It's hard for me to send emails now. Oh no, I can. I can. Y'all can't send me an email through the web, and I hate that. Because now the only thing y'all have access to is that messaging thing, and that means I've constantly got to go in there and check the, all my Blackboard sites to see if y'all sent me messages. In the OAP Blackboard, you could email me, and it would pop up on my phone. <laughs> So I, I could respond instantly, but um, so I can email you through the message, but y'all can't email me. All y'all can do is send me a message. I'm gonna complain about that. Huh? Used to on the old Blackboard, we could put a button over there that said "Email Instructor" on the left-hand side. You clicked on it, and you typed something, in, and it would come to my email address. And I would sort it into a folder for your class, and it would pop up on my cell phone saying, I got an email from you. Uh, right now, y'all don't have that ability. Right now, we're using what we call messages, which is in the upper right-hand corner. When you send me a message, it is not an email. It's a message, which means I've got to go. Now, it don't pop up on my cell phone. It don't sort into a folder. It stays in the class. But now, instead of it, me knowing without doing anything, i got to do a uh, I got to log into Blackboard Ultra and I got to check to see if I've got any messages. No, I'm using my computer. Yeah, but I'm talking about you sending me email. I, I understand that. And I can send you email, but you can't send me email, right? I'm just saying, through Blackboard. You could, but I would have to go up and set up a user group, and then I would have to put all your names inside that for me to use Outlook. Used to, it was automatically set up in Blackboard. Like I said, so I know about the great book. I know when you go on there, automatically it shows you, uh, you know, you can go to, uh, so used to, I, would, I could get emails from you and I would be down on the beach without even my computer, right? You understand? And I don't know why they took that ability away from you and gave it to me, so I don't know. I'm gonna complain about that. I made a lot of complaints about the new Blackboard, by the way. This is a, what we call a selector switch. Now, U.S. Steel does it a little different, so you get out your uh, U.S. Steel diagram. And if you look at the very bottom, right here, this is a selector switch, two-position selector switch. And it says, okay, If I put it in the reverse direction, the bottom contact's going to close. See the little, if I put it in the reverse con section, the bottom contact's going to close. And you can see five bridle jog reverse, so that's a reverse contact right there. So that means if I put, if I put it in this position, it's going to do what? No, it's a jog. What's a jog? What's the difference? What's a jog? Anybody know what a jog is? When we jog a motor. Yeah, it's just a power, it's just momentary, what we're going through. 
touch touch the button. And it would, uh, so if I came back into this circuit back here, and I came over here and added a normally open, I said a normally open put switch, just so easier to understand. So that means if I open that switch, the thing wouldn't relay, it wouldn't fill in. So now we turn this into a juncture. If I close the switch, then it would fill in, right? So this is very, very, you know, jogging is something that we do, uh, usually to move things into a position before we start, but it's just manually running them over in burst. Uh, robots, we call it that. Moving the robot to a position, we call it jogging. Because we're manually moving it, and it's not running the program. So if, uh, if I have it closed, it would be basically in automatic, because I hit the button, I just do what? I let it go, and it sits there and do this. Uh, well, that's what this is doing. It's opening the contact. Let me get back over there. <laughs> it's in here somewhere, right here. And I'm not going to bring up the draw because I might not be able to get it off. So when I put it in reverse jog, it opens this contact. When I put it in forward jog, it opens this contact. See the little X up there? And this would be a selector switch. I don't know what a selector switch is, right? Everybody okay? I'm still in part, so we have to this. I need to make sure you get these back. Uh, we don't use a lot of uh, toggle switches in uh, motors or motor controls. So one thing, they're very easy to accidentally uh, So here's the selector switch right here. Okay. And it's a three position switch. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. It's hard to do guys. So it's got one that they label auto and they got one that they label off. So here when I switch it to off then both the contacts would be open. And then if I come over and switch it to manual. Now these are just these are just labels. So uh we'll be doing we'll be doing ands, ors, nots, and nands, and you'll look at your normally closed are gonna be named are gonna be labeled stop and your normally opens are gonna be labeled st start. It's just a it, but it's just a push button, right? So you can use a normally open push button no matter what it's labeled in this lab right here, right? In our labs. It's just that they want to give you an indication of the way this would be. So this would be called, uh, uh, this has our two uh, uh, luminaries or lights on it. It also has a uh, selector switch. It has detents on it, which means what? The staying position you put in, right? So you put it into a position as soon as you let it go. And what's in toggle switches and toggle switches are little things you got to wipe around those things are real easy to accidentally right? These you gotta physically go up there and grab them and go up and turn all this water is going to this. The job thing is we're, what we're gonna do is we're going to open a contact. We're going to open contacts and close contacts. So a way, the way that thing works is, uh, let's see if I can bring up the slide. So uh, this would be like manual, and this would be what they're calling what auto. It's got two sets of contacts on it. And it's up to you to look at the diagram. So what this is saying, I see the dash line over here. It says if I put it in auto, this set of contacts down here closes. This this set of contacts would do what? They would open, right? 
if I put it in manual, then this this will close and this one open. So you can't say it's how you wire the circuit. Just because they call it manual and auto, it's how you wire the circuit, right? Understand. Uh, so if I wanted to use it as a jog button, a, a jog selector, then I might I might use. Uh, So what I would do is I would use the one labeled uh, auto. And then when you switch it to manual, it would switch over to the other contacts, which you don't have wired up, right? So that label on there is just saying it's a it's a three position jog with a center off. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a three position selector switch with a center off. If you put it one way, one set of contacts close and the other does what? Open. If you flip it in the other direction, one set of contacts uh, open and the other close. It, it's vice versa. That makes sense now? So that's just the label. So you would put it in manual, but you would wire the, you would wire, if you wanted to jog it, you'd flip it to manual, but you'd have to use the auto contacts as your ceiling. So what I'm saying is, you know, the labels are just there to show you what you're going to see in industry. When you wire the circuit up, if you need a normally open, if you need a normally closed push button, no matter what, uh, you're going to you're going to use the ones labeled stop. But you know, understand what I'm saying? I'll, but when you look at it, you'll choose the ones that are normally uh, normally closed. Yeah. So good question, yeah. So that is get kind of confusing because you're trying to figure out, but the labels are on just just there to show you way it, the way it would be in industry. Right? So this is the this is exactly the same switch, but on the U.S. steel print, it's drawn a little better, a little different, right? You see what I'm saying? Yes or no? And the labels coming there, uh, U.S. steel. Made those things. I mean, they had the thing that uh, when they make them at the like, uh, actual uh, the plastic label, put that on these things. So we buy a switch and we go over and they make whatever we wanted over there. It's pretty cheap, pretty neat machine. So basically, it's just two pieces of plastic. Had a white one on the bottom, a black one on the top, and then they just mill out the black and then it would show it white. So. Pilot light is used. We use a lot of pilot lights out there because of the NK. So all of this light right here, this is a light, that's a motor starter. Normally these touch, guys. That's a magnetic motor starter. How do I know it's a magnetic motor starter? Yeah, it's got the overload, it's good. Not because it's labeled, right? <laughs> Very seldom in industry, you're gonna see magnetic motor starter. They're gonna give that relay a name. And they're probably going to give it a name for uh, not a real, uh, uh, what we call a mnemonic, which is a memory jogger. It's just usually a series of letters or numbers that when you look at them, you can probably, once you learn the technique, you can figure out what they say. And they give them names. So here they're giving this name PL for pilot light. Where's the contact numbers over here? Huh? They're light bulbs. Light bulbs have no contacts, right? You understand that? The only thing that has contact numbers are relays, right? So this is a relay, so it's got a contact number. It shows us that it should have a normally open contact in line two. And we go down to line two, and sure enough, there it is. If I was doing line wire numbers, I'd come over and say what? I might start here with, I might start with 53. This right here would probably be what? 54? What's this one right here going to be? 54, good. <laughs> this one's going to be 55. We go through something. This is going to be 55. This will be 55, right? This right here would be what? 56. This would be 57. What would this one right here be? 
55, good. What would this one over here be? 57, good. So you don't have to start with one. It depends on where you're at, right? You understand. So this one, we would, the light would be on when the motor's running. It should be running, and the light would be off when the motor should not be running. This gives us a physical indication of what's going on. So these are very popular. You see a bunch of lights out there, flashing lights. Are we okay? Uh, this is the circuit I have wired up over here. So this is the exact same circuit. So we've got a magnetic motor starter. We've got two sections on that. Uh, so, uh, so if we call it M1, then we have the uh, three phase. Now, this is what gets people in problems because so, over here we got L2, L2, uh, L1, L2, L3. But over here, this is three phase. Over here, we have an L1 and L2. But this is going to be after a control transformer that's sitting right here. The fuse right there. I'll try not to call it L1 and L2. I'll try to call it CL1 and CL2. So you need a, so you yes, yeah, the control for it. But unfortunately, the book don't do that. Uh, over here, this is M1. So over here, I've got my power circuit. And it's got overloads in it, which are electronic overloads on this one. And then we have our three-phase motor. This is M1, M M1, M1, M1. And this would be T1, T2, T3. So this is the circuit I have hooked over here. So this is an auxiliary contact, right? And that's what I have hooked up over here that we looked at the other day. And then you look at this, and you look at that, and it's not the same, right? It's electrically the same, but it's not physically or visually the same. Over here, we're putting control devices where they need to be, right? You understand? Or push buttons and stuff like that's going to be out on an operator panel. The actual control cabinet will probably be somewhere that's not easy to get to by the operators, right? Operators have a tendency that if something's not working, they want to start screwing around with things. So it's probably somewhere got a lock on it or somewhere. And then we'll probably have to get cabinets on them to be where your power is at, and the other one will be where your control is. We got a cabinet over out oh, that we was donated from a brother. They got rid of a line out there. Uh, this is what we call it, what they're calling a sequence control. And this is not exactly, it could be. Uh, normally we might do something like this, where we want the motors to start in sequence here. So what we, we got one stop, we got a start, hit the start button, it seals in. So once this motor started, then what can we do? Then we can start this one, right? You understand that? Yes, no? So M1 has to be running before we can start M2. Uh, toward the end of the term, we'll get into what we call timers, where we can make this automatic, where you start one, and then after a certain amount of time, the next one will stop. And vice versa. We're still in the book pretty good. Uh, so we, we've already drawn this circuit. So here they're labeling it run and jog. 
This will be on the label that's on the on the selector switch. All it is is a two-position selector switch. When you put it in one position, one contact is going to close. One set of contacts are going to close. One is going to open. You put it in another position, they swap positions, right? You understand? Uh, here they're just using it as a jog control. So right now it says uh, if we put it in the run position, then it's going to be in the black line position. So notice this is dark right here. Let me draw this a different color. And then this one right here is what? Dashed. You see that? So right now, if we put it in run, the run contact will be closed, and this contact right here would be what? Open. If I was to flip it into jog, then this contact would open, and this contact right here would close. So what that's going to do is that's going to open up the jog circuit. I'm going to open up the ceiling circuit, excuse me. And now, only when I press the button, it's going to do what? It's going to run. Are we okay? Richard's steps of troubleshooting. So the first thing that we do when we troubleshoot, of course, first of all, we have to understand the operational circuit. So one of the first things that we do when you get into a plan is they'll put you with somebody. That you just do what? Uh, you shatter them. Sometimes. What they do at Rose is they move those people around to every section so they understand what, how that line is supposed to operate. So and watch your post switch the button, what position everything's gonna to have to be. So preparation, understanding operation of circuit. Next thing you'll probably do is do what? Talk to these people out there that operate things. What's this thing doing? Tell me what's going on. That was one of the most valuable pieces of information that we have before we just start going out and making measurements, right? Next thing you need to do is what? Verify the problem. A lot of times it's just switching. We uh, I worked on a computer up in Hartford, and I got a call one day and says, uh, says this, this monitor, computer monitor is not working. And so I said, is it plugged in? All this kind of stuff. I drove all the way up there, and somebody had turned the intensity down on the monitor. So uh, I didn't do much work, but uh, it was just simply that, just verify the problem. You're supposed to know how it works, right? And a lot of times it's just simply somebody got a switch in the wrong position, right? So make sure it does what it's supposed to do. That's why you got to understand it. Uh, determine the probable cause of the problem. Uh, uh, first thing we usually do when if we've got something that's totally dead, then what's the first thing we need to do once we uh, when we go out there and verify the problem? It's definitely dead, but the whole system's dead. What we put the first thing? Yeah, the whole thing's there. So I walk in here and every one of these lights are gone. So if the whole system is dead, you usually verify the source first, see if it's getting power to the system. Right? So one of the first labs we're going to do is we're going to open up that disk. I'm going to open up the disconnect. And you're going to verify the power with the light measurements inside there. Uh, this guy works uh, basically like uh, I don't have the thing here. It's got a, a master master control relay in there. And, uh, when we um, I went back on these light switches right now across these. I measured the full voltage, right? 120 volts. Across these on the outside, what would I measure? If I measure across the switch, I measure zero, right? Because the resist the switch has no resistance. So to get a voltage drop, you gotta have resistance, right? You understand? And to get a voltage drop, you gotta have current flow through things. Uh, so this is why if I come over here on a series circuit, 
You know, I could have 50 resistors over here. And if I open that switch, uh, what voltage drop would I measure across that resistor right there? Zero. Why? The voltage is here. There's no current flow through it. Yeah. So if that drops zero, that means if I had 120 volts right there, if this drops zero, I still have 120 volts right there. This drops zero because V is equal to what? I times R. So V would be equal to zero times R. We have no current flow. This guy drops no voltage. That means I have 120 volts right there. This guy drops no voltage. That means I have 120 volts right there. This guy drops no voltage. That means I have 120 volts right there. So that means I measure across that, it should measure 120 volts, right? So on a series circuit, any open element in the series circuit, the voltage across it is going to appear, the, the applied voltage, because nothing in the circuit is dropping the voltage. So all those resistors are basically like, like acting like a straight piece of wire, right? You understand that? So I don't like to say drop in on, across the device. I say it appears across there. So if we got something that's totally dead, then we verify the power, right? Uh, probable cause, look things over. Good gracious, guys. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how many things that I fix just by doing what. Just looking at it. You know. Most of the times it's just obvious. And then the next thing we do is check power, make sure we got power, and then we actually get into true troubleshooting. And we're going to do, we're going to do some of that. So on this class, when it says uh, how the how the instructor checked your circuit, I'm not checking to see if the circuit is wired correctly. I'm going to check L2 because if you don't, if you got L2 hooked up right, then there's no way in the world you can have a short circuit. So basically, I'm checking for a short circuit, and you're supposed to be doing it yourself. Um, so anytime you have a short, uh, what's what resistance you measure across the straight piece? What resistance should you measure across the straight piece of wire? Yeah, zero, right? So one of the first things you're going to do is check to see if you got short sensor between L1 and L2, and you're going to press all your push buttons. You know, if you measure pretty close to zero ohms, then you need to figure out what that is. Normally, when we troubleshoot, we trouble when we start uh, troubleshooting and checking uh, voltage levels. Uh, we move from left to right. I'm sorry, right to left. I said it wrong. Didn't I? And normally, what we like to do is we like to take our uh, one of our leads and connect it to uh, L2, and then what we start doing is we start moving from L2 toward L1. Until I see a voltage, as soon as I see your voltage, then yeah, you know where your opens right. We don't like to probe with two. We don't like to probe with two uh, meter leads inside a circuit. Why is that? First of all, you got two hands up there, right? And probably the one, mo the most, probably the m most, one of the most dangerous paths is from hand to hand, and why is that? Yeah, yeah, the current goes through your heart. AC is a little more dangerous, well, I don't know, DC, they're both, AC has a tendency to let you go. Uh, your muscles are controlled by electrical current, and so if you get into DC and it overrides your brain impulses, you might grab stuff and you can't do a lot. You can't let it go. AC goes to zero 120 times a second, so there is a chance you can get out of it. Uh, AC going through your heart is probably more dangerous than DC because AC is going to try to make your heart beat at the rate of the frequency. You know, this is when your heart goes into what we call fibrillation. But if you're just safe, guys, have I ever been shot? Yes. <laughs> but I'm still here. One, one almost got me, though. But it wasn't my fault. Uh, we were running a computer power cord uh, for our computers, and it had these big old uh, connectors. And uh, the connectors were metal, and they were supposed to be hooked to ground. They were supposed to be hooked to uh, ground. And one of the guys hooked one of the hot leads 
to the metal to the metal plug and and I picked up this guy, which was hot, right, and I grabbed the other one, which was grounded when they say tasted cotton that I like to got me huh. So normally when we troubleshoot boats, we, we, we take one of our leaks. Now, if it's DC, it's DC. When it's AC, it makes no difference if you're going to put the black lead over there or the red lead over there, no matter where you take it, because AC technically has no polarity because it's constantly what? Yeah, it's constantly swapping. Uh, DC, even with digital meters, they really don't make any difference. It's just digital meters. If you're expecting positive, you would say what well, negative. But the voltages were still calculated exactly the same. And if you understand that, uh, you'll see me. I'll, I'll inside an electronic circuit. I know it's supposed to be positive and negative, and I'll put my black lead one place, and I'll be all over the circuit. Uh, and I understand that, you know, voltage drop is voltage drop. And, but normally we take one, uh, we're going to be dealing with AC in here, 120 volts, guys. That's why we got to uh, play around with some PPE. And what we'd like you to do is have a, most, most meters come with an alligator clip you can put on both your leads. But normally what we do is we take that and clamp it onto the L2 side, and then we move toward uh, L1. But what you got to do, though, is that if you move it right here, you measure something, well, something that somebody's got to do what? Somebody got to press that button because it's going to start off with nothing there. So all your normally open devices or push buttons are going to have to do what? Uh, somebody's going to have to push me. Your normally clothes are okay. You, and we troubleshoot from L1, from the output toward the input. And this is true whether you're troubleshooting motor controls or whether you're troubleshooting power amplifiers. We normally start at the what? Output and start moving toward the what? Toward the input until we find something. Normally, power amplifiers, though, you got to use one of these. So, we'd start on magnetic motor starters. We'd start right here. Then we move right there. And this would check our what? This would check our overload, right? And then we would start moving over. Here, they're saying, uh, move your black lead there. Uh, I guess you could do that. If the overload was bad, you could check. So you could check. Uh, so if you measure nothing, if you measure nothing between, well, this is not true either, guys. AC, AC induces voltages in everything. So when you're in a live AC circuit, your meter would probably never show exactly zero. Uh, we call these ghost voltages. Uh, but it's going to be a lot lower than what you expect to measure. You can take that, you can take a meter, put it on AC, and you can start moving close to that transformer, and you'll see it starts measuring stuff because it's actually inducing the voltage into the into the leads. So very seldom do you ever measure zero in an AC circuit, even across an open. But it's going to be what? It's going to be really low, right? A lot lower than what it's supposed to be. DC, though, if you turn DC off, you will measure zero, unless there's a lot of AC around there. So we try not to use ammeters very often. We like to try to troubleshoot uh, either with ohmmeters. Don't put an ohmmeter into a circuit with power applied, right? We like to use both meters and ohmmeters. Why do we don't really like to use ammeters? Now, luckily, AC will induce voltages, and the amount of voltages that it induces is directly proportional to the strength of the field. So in AC, we do have a device called a clamp-on ammeter uh, that you can literally just come and put it across, clamp it across a wire, and it'll measure the voltage. The only problem we have on those things, those things are usually rated at about 40 amps. <laughs> And there is a trick, I'll show you all that. Uh, so the problem we, we have with those is that you got to be in a real high current application to do that. But the advantage of those is you don't have to do what? Break the circuit. So on an ammeter, you literally have to do what? You have to make the current flow through the meter, so you have to break the circuit. So you break the circuit with power off, all right? 
put your meter in there, get away from the meter and turn it on, you know, turn the power on. Uh, if you take the sensors class in T2, uh, we'll, be, we'll be measuring the uh, output of some of our solid state sensors just to get a feel. You know. So it don't say you're it doesn't say you're never ever ever going to measure current, but uh, with a current uh, with an ammeter, but we try to avoid it. That's our that's the last thing we try to do, right? You understand that? I'll show you. we got a clamp on ammeter uh, clamp on ammeter back here that uh, I'll have to show you. A solid state sensor will drop a voltage if it's used in a high voltage circuit. So uh, solid state sensors, uh, I think ours uh, drops around six volts, four to six volts. But we're, up, we're running that in a 120 volt circuit, which means that six volts won't hurt you, right? You understand that? Because we still get 114 volts, which is well within the limit of, of these devices. So some of your solid state sensors, uh, we call them two wire sensors because they power up through the load, and they're going to have to drop a voltage so they can do work. Everybody understand that? So solid state sensors don't have contacts. They are solid state devices that's causing to simulate a contact. And since that, they're going to always drop a voltage, right? You understand that? Uh, you get into low power circuits, uh, these solid state sensors will be what we call three wire sensors. Uh, where you literally have to hook them up across the line because on a 24 volt circuit you can't afford to drop six volts, right? Uh, so these are what we call three wire sensors. We'll show you all some of these when we get into the sensor section. Uh, the sensor that we're going to use is called an inductive sensor. I can't remember which lab it is in, but it's a two wire sensor. So it runs off 120 volts, they said. And if you measure across it, when it's true, when it's Simulating a close contact, you're going to measure about four to six volts. Relays and everything's still going to work because you're only losing six volts on 120 volts, right? Makes sense. So unfortunately, uh, if you see the diamond, if you see the diamond shape, so this is a what we call a solid state. Most people call it a solid state limit switch even though it detects a bunch of stuff. Inductive sensors sense metal. So, anybody ran into an inductive sensor lately? Well, where where do we run into metal detectors all over the place now? Well, here, get, getting here, traffic lights. Yeah, so those those loops that you see out there in a row, those are nothing but inductive sensors. That sits in the metal in your car. That's all they are. So if I was to draw it, I would draw it in a diamond shape. And so unfortunately with motor controls, uh, all your solid state sensors have the same symbol. It's the symbol of a lot. A diamond. Could be an inductive sensor, could be a capacitive sensor, could be an optical sensor, could be a lot of sensors. But the only way you know what it is is if you go out and look at it. In uh, PLCs we use different symbols for uh, for each category of sensor. But these guys are going to drop a, these guys are going to drop a voltage these single these two wire sensors so uh they're metal these are going to be metal detectors so you'll be able to use a key or anything you got available to you and just move it up to it and it should trigger the circuit so on a motor control diagram if you see this symbol right here what does that tell you it's an electronic sensor no moving parts. And these are becoming very, very popular because they can sense. Uh, we're going to use a sensor called a limit switch. Uh, we'll use that in several labs. And then we'll have one lab where we'll do one with an uh, inductive sensor. Which is, uh, if you take the uh, sensors class that's being offered in T2, uh, we'll deal with. Uh, Inductive sensors, capacitive sensors, we'll deal with uh, optical sensors, uh, level sensors, temperature sensors, and pressure sensors in there. We'll talk about a bunch of sensors, but that's the one we'll like to do last week. 
Okay, guys, I'll take another break. Now, what we're going to do is, uh, this is, uh, and we've got a control transformer. How much resistance does a transformer have? Is it going to be high? Is it going to be low? Huh? Across the transformer, just across the windings. You know, the more windings you put in series, you know. So one of the things we do this, uh, and sometimes they give you the values, sometimes they don't. Uh, let's pause this.